Naman, I'm really delighted that you can be with us here today. And we're so looking forward to this very interesting lecture. I know it's on a single topic and you will weave your story around it. So on behalf of the chairman, CSMVS, the trustees, the DG, Mr. Sabyasachi Mukherjee, and on my own behalf, and on the behalf of my executive committee, my members and all our guests who have joined us here this evening, a very warm welcome to you. And ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Professor Dr. Naman Piyahuja, who's the curator and professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and editor of MARG Publications. His studies on Indian art have explored the aesthetics of Indian visual culture, iconography, and transculturalism in antiquity, as well as the legacy of our arts and crafts movement in the modern period. Apart from various research papers, very, very many, far too many, all peer reviewed, he has authored the following books. I'll just name a few. Divine Presence, The Art of India and the Himalayas, which came out in 2003, published both in Barcelona and Milan. The Making of the Modern Indian Artist Craftsman by Rutledge in 2011. The Body in Indian Art and Thought in, from Antwerp in 2013. The Arts and Interiors of Rashtrapati Bhavan, Latins and Beyond, a New Delhi publication in 2016. And last but not the least, India and the World, a history in nine stories brought out by the uh, Penguin in 2017 and a seminal work in 2018, The Art and Archaeology of Ancient India, Oxford from the Ashmolean Museum. We have a very, very erudite speaker in our presence today. And Naman, once again, thank you so much for addressing the CSMBS and the MSM in Mumbai. Just a brief outline, ladies and gentlemen, to our audience who have joined us. What are we about to hear? You heard the title, The Border is a Cusp, a 17th century red velvet tent panel in the National Museum, New Delhi. Living in tented dwellings takes us to think about nomads who do not have a fixed sense of belonging to a nation, but often their cultural moorings are more of kinship located in nature with rich language and performance traditions, all of which are mobile. What can a grand 350 year old red velvet tent panel in the National Museum, New Delhi, tell us about the context in which it was used and what resonance does it have for us today when we live in a closed concrete space? Difficult times but Dr. Ahuja is going to challenge us and lead us through a fascinating lecture. Sit back and you know, enjoy the evening. And before I hand over to Naman, technical team led so easy, ably by our own Dr. Professor Jason Johns. And this evening we have our stalwarts, Aishwarya and Rinalini. Thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the evening, as I said, and over to you, Naman. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm delighted to be here with you today. I'm Naman Ahuja, a professor of art history at JNU in Delhi. And I'm also the editor of Mark Foundation here in Mumbai. A few years ago, um, I co-curated an exhibition here in Mumbai at the CSMBS. And um, there were lots of very exciting objects that were shown and many of you must have come to the CSNBS to see that exhibition. But I hadn't quite the opportunity at that time to be able to explain my rationale for the selection of some of the objects in the show. And so I thought that today um, I'd use the opportunity to talk to the Museum Society about one just one of the objects that was in that show. So that you might get a little window into the kind of research that goes into the selection of an object and how there is so much rich history that lies behind 
each object that we have in the museum. And, um, and also to try and understand that when a curator or a researcher is trying to communicate to the public, there are so many layers of meaning and interpretation that lie behind it. So I've titled my talk for today, The Border is a Cusp. And I'm going to be talking about a 17th century red velvet panel, which is from the collection of the National Museum in New Delhi. Okay, so let me start sharing my slides with you and for you to be able to get right into what it is that I mean. It's a very beautiful textile and it was chosen for a gallery called Court Culture or Courtly Culture. Now, before I get into the specific reasons as to why it was selected for the exhibition, what do we know about tents and why are tents so important? Well, the tents of the last great garden dwellers, as I call them, who lived in the paradisiac river flows of South Asia, today lie preserved in either the Rajput courts of Jaipur or Jodhpur. They are remarkable examples of the physical mobility of people. Tented dwellings brought one community into contact with another, creating a space where change took place in the nature of a traveler, as well as of the people that that traveler came into contact with. In my talk today, I'm going to examine the story of this one panel of red velvet from a Mughal or a Rajput tent to see how it opens up an understanding of mobility, mobility not just of people, but of material. And it also shows a mobility in taste, which in turn is reflective of an aspirational mobility of class, of custom, and is indicative of a kind of social change. About five years ago, we were in the midst of a detailed discussion on curating the selection of objects from Indian museums, which we were going to pair with objects that came from the rest of the world for this exhibition called India and the World. My co-curator and I were charged with bringing to bear a history that showed some of the sumptuousness of the courts. Yet, one of the things that affected me at least was that surely extravagance was not one of the most important aspects of telling the history of the world. Luxury and richness can be seen very differently by those viewing the culture from a different social class. What about the, that class for whom the very object of splendor can be a marker of their oppression? It can be the other community that you despise for their wealth. Yet courtly culture, preserved and codified the customs and etiquette of a civilization. It holds relevance for a people and it earns the respect of that people who may wish to emulate it. So I was discussing all of these issues with my friend Rahul Jain, the textile technologist. And he told me that the National Museum of India had a portion of the same remarkable Mughal style tent that lay in scattered in many other museum collections of the world. And it made an ideal choice for the gallery for many reasons, not just because of the scale and so on, but because of what this fantastic piece of red was actually trying to communicate. This panel comes from a grand Shamiana that was once in the Tosha Khana of the Royal Collection of Jaipur, from where it was dispersed sometime before 1984. The tent panel that forms the central object of my study belongs to the same set of tent panels that are now lying in the Calico Museum, apart from what remains still locked up in the Jaipur Tosha Khana. There are over 16 tent panels which are published from the same tent. The National Museum's panel, which is 2.6 meters high, forms probably the largest one from the group because the others are fragmented or cut at the bottom or at the top and so on. Now, what do we know about these tents? Well, the first thing is Mughal tents were probably like portable cloth palaces. 
They were base camps for military campaigns, which occupied Mughal rulers like Akbar Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb for exceptionally long periods in their lives. Tents were their royal homes away from home from which affairs of state were conducted, where guests were received and from where a vast empire was administered. The tent had to be folded up. It was carried with an enormous retinue and re-erected at a suitable place. It transpires that the actual homes of the Mughal emperors for 40% of their time was indeed the tented palace, according to some detailed calculations on how much time the emperors spent in their palaces versus their tents during the period 1556 to 1739. So Agra was Akbar's official capital for 36 years out of his nearly 50 year reign. And of those 36 years, he was away in camps for 22 years. That means 60% of his total regnal time was spent in a tented township. Jahangir similarly was absent from Agra for 14 out of his 22 year rule. The National Museum panel is closely comparable in dimensions to the panels that I was saying that now lie in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, for instance, here, which has been revealed form part of the walls of an enclosure rather than its ceiling, which would have been about one meter lower in size. So we've got two big sizes of tents that have been found. And these are from the walls of the tent. And then we found another set of panels which come from the sloping ceiling of the tent. And then there are other panels which form the interior of the tent. There are other versions of fragments of this tent which are also lying in the collection of the VNDA, for instance, which you can see over here, comes from the same tent. At over 2.6 meters in height, the National Museum and the Metropolitan Museum pieces are higher than the sight of a person on horseback. Now, this is an essential design requirement. Remember, people are going about these tented townships on horses, and you don't want them peering into your encampment. And so the height of the wall should be at least that, that tall. The Met piece still carries traces of leather tabs at the back to strengthen the baton pockets that would have accommodated the supports used to erect this shamiana. So the poles that would have gone in to support it, there are leather backings on the pieces of the mat. The inner lining, however, is only lying preserved at, in the collection of the VND. And you can see that it is made out of embroidered gold, gold thread, which has been embroidered with these um, lotus-like or rosette patterns. Um, which make up the entire interior. So the interior was quite a different space. It was this lovely pastel gold and pink interior, while the exterior was this rich red and gold. This is startling because one would imagine the red would have been, it would have been the desired and more sumptuous interior at first glance. When they were all together, these textiles, which are now scattered, must have formed the interior of a grand tented palace. The decor would have been a series of arched niches in gold outline against a deep red velvet background, each containing a large floral spray derived from the motif of a poppy. Delicate and expensive velvet adorned, the gold leaf, adorned with gold leaf does not, at first at least, appear to be a suitable material for the exterior. Of a, of a city or exterior of a camp, incapable as it would have been to withstand the dust and the rain. How then has this tent panel survived? Was it only something ornamental or is there another reason why it has survived? Abu Fazl's account in the Ayn Akbari is informative. He clarifies firstly that there were essentially two main types of camps. Small ones that were used for short journeys and hunting parties, while larger camps, which were like veritable townships, were intended for royal tours and military expeditions, that the office of the tent manager, tent manager was of tremendous importance. The red tent 
was reserved for the king because it was the most sumptuous. Many further cloth walls and screens would have made up the whole tented encampment surrounding the royal tent with carpets and mats pressing down and soaking up the dust. This tent must have been more protected from the elements and that might explain how such a panel has survived. When talking about the camps made for expeditions, Abu Fazl writes that first the Gulal Bar, the red wall, is a great fence brought into use by the Lord of the world, which by which he means Akbar. The quality and importance of the tent is made clear further on when Abu Fazl describes the office of the tent pitcher himself. He says, quote, the emperor regards the office of the tent pitcher, this department as an excellent dwelling place, a shelter against the heat and the cold, a protection against rain and an ornament for the emperor. And because he considers its decorativeness as a part of the pomp of sovereignty, he accounts the care given it as divine worship. So in other words, the person who looks after the tent is fulfilling his divine duty. That's how this tent has really survived. <laughs> he carries on. Through his expert knowledge, it has been improved in both quality and quantity and enhanced the cheerful appearance of new types of tents. I shall record part of these things and review some examples for the benefit of those who wish to know. The Barga, which is the tent of state, can, in the largest cases, hold 10,000 people or more who can sit in its shade. A thousand skilled tent pitchers erect such a tent in one week with the help of traction machines. Most tents have two main poles, each of which is jointed together with several iron bands. Plain ones in which cloth of gold and velvet and gold fringes are not used cost 10,000 rupees and more. But the value of the richly worked ones is beyond the limit of words. The price of other kinds is analogous to the former, i.e. the cheaper tents of 10,000 rupees each. But these ones, like we are looking at, were hugely expensive. So moving on from the Ayan Yakhbar, we must also know that tented dwellings have been used for millennia. And few parts of the world can rival their rich history among, apart from what we have in from Central Asian nomads, which includes the ancestors of the Mughals themselves, or what we know about tents from the Arabian deserts. The type and nature of tents changed over time. Bernard O'Kane, for instance, says that the value of tents can also be gauged from the way in which they were considered to be parts of the treasury. They were included in the dowry of one of Timur's wives. And on campaign, Timur occasionally gave presents of tents to captured royalty or to generals who had distinguished themselves. The few references to contemporaneous tents in Sultanate times in India revealed that they were already using the red enclosure in the encampment for the ruler. Such considerable investment in the preference to live in nature, enjoying different climates, must of course go back to grand old Mongol and nomadic times. It was important to the many migratory communities of the world, the Rabaris, the Bajaras, and the Bedouins too. Now about this particular tent, Peter Andrews states that the inside is decorated with cloth of gold and velvet, and the outside with scarlet, broad cloth surrounded with a girth of silken webbing called Navari. This then must have been the outer shell of the golden core, the red shell for the golden core. Accounts reveal that nearly 1,000 carpets covered the floor of just the Divane Khas. Rougher carpets and mats would cover the dusty ground throughout the tented encampment. Not only was the paraphernalia of the office of the tent master enormous, the whole collection had to be duplicated, i.e. you had to have two such tents at least. One set 
the Pish Khana needed to be sent on ahead to be erected and wait the arrival of the emperor and his followers, while the one that had just been occupied had to be packed up and taken to the next destination where the emperor would be coming a week or two later. Each encampment required 100 elephants, 500 camels, 400 carts, and 100 bearers, as well as up to 2,000 foot soldiers and laborers to create the tent. So this is the paraphernalia of the people who are in charge of the tent, moving along with the courtly officials and the dancers and the administrators and the hunters and the servants and the cooks and everyone else who's moving who are the residents of the tent in any case. Um, the core administrators and all of this lot was with this supporting group of the people who would create the tented township. So as is to be expected, the township could not cover a distance of more than 16 kilometers in a day. The historian and archeologist Carla Sinipoli elaborates on the planning of these tented townships. She says, the imperial camp was constructed according to a formal plan described as a mobile version of Akbar's capital of Fatehpur Sikri. A large wall of cloth screens enclosed the royal camp, forming an east-west oriented rectangle that was nearly 1400 meters long, 1.4 kilometers long. The emperor's tent and royal reception areas were consistently placed in the center of the eastern end of the enclosure. His was the only two storage tent in the imperial camp enclosed within walls of distinctive scarlet cloth. Next to the emperor was a screened area containing the tents of the royal harem. And beyond this were enormous awnings for public and private royal audiences. Tents for nobles were aligned in carefully specified locations that spatially expressed their relations with the ruler. So the closer you were to the emperor's tent, the more important you were. She continues, beyond the royal enclosure were the tents of lesser nobles and the military, as well as administrative facilities, stables, arsenals, workshops of attached specialists, and the kitchens. Merchants and money lenders formed neat bazaar areas along the streets of the massive tent city. Close quote. This tented township then makes us understand the ideas we now associate with vernacular architecture of ephemeral materials. So much more. Students of architecture taught all too often in their lessons on art and architectural history that. Perishable antecedents provided the impetus to building the permanent structures that we now study of stone. Can we then use the rich information that surrounds Mughal tentage to see how it may have inspired the buildings of the Mughals? Can it be equally true then that rather than the city of Fatehpur Sikri being the model for the tented township, it was the other way around, wherein centuries of spatial organization that had been learned through the erection and re-erection of tents in which emperors spent much of their lives, gave urban planners the much needed experience that they required. But this brings me to my next issue of mobile sovereignty. Even though the tent was lavish, it also carried with it a capacity of allowing the emperor to be subject to the vagaries of the weather to encounter new habitats and people. As much as we think of the people coming to the court and being struck by the aura of the emperor, something we see in page after page in the grand hierarchy of tents as they are organized in the paintings, for instance, of the Pachanama, um, you know, you can see over here on one of the paintings. We also need to remember, it was the king who parked himself in areas where he would receive ambassadors and other kings. So it wasn't that these were people who were coming to Agra to meet the king. The king could also go to his lands and be in a space in a neutral territory near his ambassadors, near his uh, rivals and near his feudatories. 
The tent, the tent strengthened the monarch's connection with his people and the land. The grandeur of the royal tent is noted in nearly every ambassador's account. This opulence was deliberate. It made the necessary impact to maintain hierarchies. Shah Jahan's chronicler and Aurangzeb's teacher, Muhammad Saleh, provides a description which makes clear that the imperial tent was spectacular and celestial in appearance. Awesomeness apart, he further notes that the labor and mechanical devices required for its elevation and maintenance was equally grand. A veritable performance and a boastful prerogative of a mobile display of imperial power that could arrive, if you were lucky, just outside your land. And if you were not, within your own territory and just lay claim to your land. <laughs> the slow march of the mobile court had a huge impact on the artistic traditions and courtly etiquette of the people that the emperor's paraphernalia now encountered. Even more powerful, however, was the idea that the king could function from multiple capitals, not just Agra, Delhi, Lahore, which were constructed of stone, but the mobile ones ensured that there were other functioning headquarters as well. These notions of mobile sovereignty come down from Mongol times. Was this the case with the Rajputs as well? After all, this panel that I am examining today comes from Jaipur. Zirvat Chaudhary has revealed how Jodhpur's ruler Abhay Singh, who ruled in the second quarter of the 18th century, emulated the Mughal tent and courtly culture to be able to assert his own authority. The interior of the tents was generally lined with a material different from the outside, which was red, a color that was strictly guarded as royal privilege. So embedded was the Lal Dera in the public consciousness as a seat of power, that it served exactly the type of propaganda a Rajput ruler like Abhay Singh then required after having come to power himself in less than honorable circumstances. The pomp and authority exerted by the Mughal tent provided exactly the legitimacy that he required. Red tents were reserved for the royal enclosure, and this can be seen in the paintings and the folios of the Babar Nama, for instance. Red tents are the prerogative of the emperor throughout the Middle East since Seljuk times, in fact. The panel at the National Museum may have been made as early as the reign of Raja Jai Singh, who ruled between 1611 to 1667. It could also probably have been made in the reign of his successor, Raja Ram Singh I, who ruled from 1667 to 1688. Now that gives me a very broad range in the 17th century. And I'll explain why. But both of these were rulers of Amer, not from Jaipur, which became the capital later on. The Amer court had close relations with the Mughals ever since the reign of Akbar, who forged an, alli an alliance with Raja Man Singh I and made him a general and a chosen minister. The families intermarried and innumerable gifts, books and carpets were exchanged between both courts. Mughals and Rajputs, it is well known, had essentially close ties and were deeply interconnected through diplomacy and marriage and deeply connections. Rajput cousins of Mughal princes would have grown up around, grown up and around them in the tented palaces. And so moving from its form and function, we now come to a question about whether the present tent which was found originally in the stores of the palace of Jaipur was a Rajput or a Mughal object? And further, how can we date it? Now I'd like to begin by trying to date the material, the motif, and the color red itself. And this is the job of textile historians and art historians to come together. In parts where it is well preserved, the National Museum's Kanat is crimson, but the parts that have faded look scarlet. This is offset by the applied gold leaf, as you would have seen in the previous slides, a few slides back. Um, here, for instance. 
Now this gold was much black velvet in the shape of the pattern with the help of a wooden block or template as one would do when doing painting on a wall or now in Sanganeri text as when you see Khadi, it is done in the same way. Associates of New York in 1995 and was found, and this is to something quite important the red dye on this textile comes from two sources first coach nail and secondly lark lark which is an imported dye is significant unlike madder which is derived from a root and ochre which comes from a mineral both lark and coach nail are derived from insects. American cochineal was introduced in Asia first in the 16th century. This is an early example the absorption of, um, of the absorption of American trade in distinctive luxury materials like cochineal at the same time when items of personal adornment such as Colombian emeralds and plants like marigold flowers and food like tomatoes and potatoes and chilies entered India from the Americas, forever changing how Indians ate and the most essential flower with which they worship, the marigold, all imported from the Americas. Extremely expensive trade records show that attempts by English merchants to sell cochineal in India met with little success and was used only by the wealthiest. Its extensive presence on the many surviving panels of this tent might indicate that the velvet itself might have come from elsewhere, possibly Europe, rather than having been made locally with expensive cotton dye. Now there is a rich history of similarly shaded red velvets used in European, especially Venetian contexts. They often have a deep red dye. And in their case, in European cases, in the European situation, it was used again for the most important royal and papal ranks. The history of silk velvet is closely tied with Ottoman velvets of 1550 to 1650. Highly prized these velvets made their way to Hindustan at about the same time. So we're talking in the 16th century. For instance, Andrews quotes the famous Timurid historian the author of the Humayunama, the Asadin Pandamir's account of 1535, where he reports that in 1533, he saw a tent made of mahmal farang right? Mahmal-e-Farang, farangi mahmal, or European velvet, in the vicinity of Gwalior in Hindustan. Andrews also cites Sir Thomas Rowe, who was the English ambassador to India in 1615 to 1618, who mentions that Venetian hangings of velvet with gold in the ladies' quarters of the court of Jahangir was being used. Now, velvet is, strictly speaking, in Indian languages known as makhmal, as opposed to chenille, which is the French, chenille, called in Hindustani as chenille. Makhmal e badalabaf, or brocaded velvet, is a term distinctly Indian and not found in Arabic, Persian, or Turkish texts. So that's Mahmal with Badal embroidery. Mahmal e Farang is also a term found widely in Indo-Persian texts up to the end of the reign of Jahangir, which refers to European velvets that were being imported. What makes matters confusing when reading the literature is that while several writers talk of expensive silks and brocaded and embroidered ones too, as being made in India, it is not always clear if they were unfamiliar with the specific words for velvet or carpets with a pile. So are they talking about a silk carpet or are they talking about a silk velvet? You know, it's not clear when we're reading the original Farsi text. The study of velvets should technically speaking be done alongside carpets since both use the same technique of rendering a supplementary pile on top of the base walker and weft. Silk pile carpets were certainly made in India during the reign of Shah Jahan, again pointing to a naturalization of using that particular technique of silk pile 
sometime toward the end of the first quarter of the 17th century. Pashmina pile carpets were made on a silk woof and weft, but silk pile carpets, although known, apparently did not become popular till the 18th century. And this is one of those examples. It is not absolutely certain, therefore, if the cloth of the red velvet tent panels retrieved from the Jaipur Posha Khana is Indian or not. It could be Dutch. And Veronica Murphy in the VNA, when the Indian Heritage Exhibition was being curated in 1982, wrote that she felt that it might be actually 18th century, um, citing an opinion that said that it couldn't have been made before 1725. Now, I, I don't really agree with that, and most scholars now don't agree with that, and believe that it must have been made at least 50 or 60 years before that, in about the mid 1600s instead. Rahul Jain has studied a group of the earliest known in Indian velvets from the reign of Shah Jahan, which are now preserved in the Calico Museum in Ahmedabad for their stylistic features, structure, and their technology. The stylistic features leave little doubt that the treatment of those velvets which are in the Calico Museum is distinctly Indian and Mughal and must have been made specially for the Mughal court. They therefore suggest that it is likely that the tradition of making silk velvet was adopted in India somewhere during the reign of Shah Jahan. Unlike the later Jaipur red velvet, however, the early Shah Jahani pieces which are in the Calico Museum are all in soft shades of beige and gold with raised cut irises and other flowers which are typical or distinctive of the style between 1635 to 1650. And I showed you one of those a little while ago with that pale beige gold um, uh, interior panel, which is from a curtain um, uh, hanging, uh, from a wall hanging from the Shah Jahan period. Similar floral patterns, such as the one in the Calico Museum's Mughal, early Mughal Shah Jahani panel, are a widespread occurrence on the walls in the paintings of the Padshah Nama as well. Every individual bud and blossom in the earlier ones is given attention. So you will see a beautiful single poppy like a natural history drawing together with its leaves. Um, the stem is more erect and the whole thing is of all about a singular flower, a singular stalk. Whereas in the National Museum panel, which we've been looking at, you see a spray coming out of a single stem and the flowers are all a little bit more squashed and there are many more leaves. And this kind of a florid pattern, which is more busy, tends to be of a slightly later period. There are other reasons why we can give it a post Shah Jahani date as well. And I'll come to that in a second. The biggest reason stylistically why it should be given a slightly later date is because of the shape of the cusp of the arch. At first glance, it is obvious that a cusp arch with a poppy motif would be dated to the reign of Shah Jahan at the earliest. And given that the poppy seems to have compressed flowers, many leaves, and the cusp of the arch itself is a little bit squat or squashed, it shows a debasement of a pattern that would have been at its peak in the reign of Shah Jahan and could be regarded as coming probably, therefore, from the reign of Aurangzeb. Dating textiles on the basis of an analysis of its style when compared with architecture and painting needs to be attempted with caution. Textiles have their own history and were oftentimes the place where techniques, ideas, and motifs were experimented on before they were committed to stone or even incorporated into official paintings. The presence of floral sprays in the arches can be seen as early as 1519 in the Harim tents in the famous VNA Akbar Nama, as you can see in this painting, which is um, a very familiar painting to all students of Mughal art, where you can see um, Akbar slaying animals in an enclosure at the occasion of the punishing of Hamid Bakari. However, the arches in this tent are not cusped, and the flowers are in the nature of sprays of blossoms rather than a single plant that has been amplified. 
By contrast, the depiction of the red tent panels with gold khadi or uh, flowers, the, the gilded barak that has been placed on them, um, in the paintings of Maharana Ari Singh of Mewar um, in about 1767 are more gold than red. So the, there's a reversal of the palette. They start showing in the Rajput court, they want this to be more gold than to be more red. It's stuffed with gilt flowers and leaves, a style which tends to be emulated in the Rajput paintings of Kota from the early to mid 19th century as well. When discussing comparable material from Kota, it seems that the tradition only reached there sometime in the 18th century. As evidence for this can be seen in the Rajput paintings of Ari Singh and Sangram Singh, which you can see you know, a trace of, uh, a shadow of in this particular picture. But it is no doubt made by a similar workshop to the one that produced the older Jaipur Toshakhana tent. Paintings from Kota show red being used inside a tent or palace. However, in Jaipur, paintings of 1830, they can be seen outside as well. Could this Jaipur tent, which must originally have been vivid when it was first made late in the reign of Jai Singh I, have faded so badly because it began to be used on the outside by rulers like Sabai Jai Singh III in the 1830s? You see, a tent like this must have been in their possession for over a hundred years. Now, the way in which it was used by your forefather might not be the same setting in which their, their descendants may wish to use the tent. So a tent which was intended for an exterior might have been turned and into a tent and a velvet for an interior at a later date, which is quite likely, I think, given the nature of the shift in taste of what went on in the Rajput courts. Later Indian velvets from the 19th century are widely preserved. Invariably embroidered in the Badla technique, they're found in almost all North Indian royal collections. Given the differences in the qualities of velvet material, techniques, and style, there is no doubt, in my mind at least, that the Jaipur velvet tent panels could not be as late as these and are likely to date from the reign of Aurangzeb or perhaps very late in the reign of Shah Jahan, that is, late in the reign of Jai Singh I of Amir or his successor, Raja Ram Singh I. That would have been a period when cultural interconnections between the Mughal and Jaipur courts would have been prolific, craft technologies would have been shared widely, and would have been a phase when Jaipur itself would have become a nodal point that lent the capacities of its many karkhanas to other Rajput states. Now here I should say that there has been some recent work which has been done by Ms. Sumit, who has gathered a lot of the bahis, the records of the imperial karkhanas of Amey that tell us about the specific guilds of the dyers, the records of the fabric dyers of Jaipur, of Amey, and what materials they used. So we do know that this was a very important imperial, um, uh, so this activity was supported by the imperial court important enough for it to be recorded. So coming towards the conclusion, little advance has been made in scholarship about the actual workings of these design textile studios, the payments to workshops, the lot of the weavers, or even their procurement of raw material from the records of Mughal and Rajput courts. By contrast, Despite the limited nature of the information we have from Indian records, years of research on the oeuvre of the painters has finally yielded a turning point in scholarship that allows the scores of unsigned works to be attributed to a particular painter's hand and linked with his or her biography. The interactions with their patrons, the industry that supported them, and the histories of the workshops and communities in which they worked are becoming so much better known to us now. A kanat such as this on luxurious velvet that either came from Europe or emulated European velvet in India, dyed with South American ingredients, decorated in gold in a pattern made popular by Shah Jahan, but printed 
in the long-standing technique of Rajasthan's khadi work, found in the storerooms of a Rajput king, enamored by the court customs of his Mughal neighbors, encapsulates a rich history of India and the world. The early Mughal emperors and their courts were constantly on the move and spent almost as much time in tented palaces as in the cities that they founded. These ephemeral but lavish mobile palaces drew praise in the accounts of Mughal and, and European chroniclers. Apart from just the movement of material and technique that connect the world, in the exhibition India and the World, we wanted to show that courtly culture, manners, and etiquette are something that move with people and materials. The absorption of this tent into a Rajput environment then reveals the aspiration to a new high culture through a type of interior decor. This fashion itself and the style thus is a signifier of so much more than just a limited understanding of, of copying of one person's style by another person. It shows the adoption of a hierarchy, the desire for the possession of an identity. The intention of the gallery in which it was displayed was to show how complex these exchanges were and how cultures and traditions were adopted and adapted anew. Such transformations were not limited to or only within India. Near this tent panel were displayed other artworks from the 16th and 17th centuries, which captured, which captured similar rich stories. The celebrated artist Dura's famous etching of an Indian rhinoceros that had arrived in Lisbon as a gift from the Sultan of Gujarat, a sketch of the famous European painter Rembrandt made when copying a mobile portrait of, ja of Shah Jahan, of Jahangir, sorry, were both examples of the great fascination with it, the exoticism of another land. A group of Japanese paintings nearby in the showcase that you see near us uh, revealed how they promoted ideals of Chinese courtly culture and social aspirations, but in Japan. A portrait of the African Ethiopian slave Malikambar from Ahmednagar in this gallery, for those of you who remember from five years ago, <laughs> revealed how an African became a prime minister in India. So to make its point about mobility of tradition, the adoption of identity, this gallery began with a painting from the Babar Nama, which I showed you earlier, which showed how the emperor Babar wanted to impress the local rulers of the region of Kohat in the Northwest frontier by throwing them a feast in his Lal Dera or his red tent. While beside it, was an example of one such tent. And you can see this tent in the gallery occupying an important location in the center of the room. Today, my talk has been titled, The Border is a Cusp. <laughs> Why, you may ask. Well, the obvious answer is because the textile has a border in the shape of a cusp arch. Cusp arches, as I explained, are known to have been popularized in the architecture of Shah Jahan. And over time, this multi-lobed arch began to become more compressed. The border thus is one of the things that uh, is thus one of the things that allows us to date this textile. However, it also forms another kind of cusp because it shows the fluid borders between Mughal and Rajput ideas. One of the dictionary meanings of a cusp is a point of transition between two different states of being. And as I just tried to show, not only is the cusp, within, which is shown in this tent, showing the cultural interconnections between the Mughals and the Rajputs, but it also shows how a cusp between a courtly interior and the wilder outdoors. It forms a cusp between luxury and utilitarianism. And finally, it shows the importance of this mobility, not just in how one culture learned how to make velvets and carpets from another, but also the materials that they use, such as the dyes, lac, and cochineal, which came from insects that were native to two diametrically opposite ends of the earth, all brought together in this one object 
which is a symbol of cultural mobility. Lest we forget, mobility leads to identities anew. The Mongolian and Chagatai or Turki word for a tented camp, as I showed you in the diagram earlier, is called an Urdu or Urdu, the word we know as a standard and common term for the same tented encampment of Hindustan, where different people were forced to live cheek by jowl, and where in these tented townships, a new language developed that was given the name Urdu, after the name of the camps in which it evolved. What can be a greater reminder of the richness of intermixing of cultures, people, traditions, and identities, than to get a sense of the circumstances in which the birth of a beautiful new language that expresses the confluence of cultures took place. I leave you with a vision of one such Urdu. Thank you all very much. And I'll try and take any questions if you have any.